with the blessings of the Creator, we can do this together. And with events like this, I am so proud and so honored to be here. Ho mitake oyasi, we are all related. Oh. Perhaps the easiest way to describe the National Council for the Traditional Arts, or NCTA, is to say they're in the miracle business. They are to folk festivals what Johnny Appleseed was to apple trees. Wherever the nonprofit arts organization goes, folk music, traditional culture, and pride in America's ethnic heritage take root and grow. After visits by the NCTA's National Folk Festival, thriving local festivals sprang up in Bangor, Maine, Richmond, Virginia, Lowell, Massachusetts, Dayton, Ohio, and other places. And each town will tell you it was a miracle. In Bangor, the 2004 National Folk Festival drew 145,000 people to a town of 34,000. A miracle? In 2009, 120,000 attended in Butte, population 33,000. The National changes the cities it visits forever. The Bangor waterfront was once a place of decay and embarrassment. It is now a tourist attraction with a performance center that draws thousands to its summer concert series. Butte used to regard its ruined mines as a blight, but when the National used an old mining head frame as the backdrop for its main stage, it became a source of great pride, the landscape that makes Butte, Butte. If ever a single event has the capacity to bring a city alive, this is it, says Montana Governor Brian Schweitzer. Michael Doucet of Beausoleil told Inside Arts magazine, you look out and see whole families together, young kids and old folks, all enjoying the same things. And that's hard to see most places today. Sounds miraculous, but not to the national. In the still segregated America of 1936, a Kiowa Indian girl named Leota Ware performed at the festival. When she told her grandmother what she'd seen, blacks, whites, Latinos, Native Americans sharing their music, eating together, talking together, her grandmother said, heaven will be like that. Their plan is wondrously simple. The National Folk Festival comes to a town for a three-year residency, working closely with local government and cultural groups. The goal is a successful event, of course, but also to create an ongoing local festival in its wake. It is remarkable how many ways this turns potentially dangerous energy into powerful synergy. Because the festivals are in urban areas with city government as partners, they have access to police, fire, health, zoning, things that can often derail cultural events. Because the goal is to create a local festival, the parochial power struggles that often destroy these partnerships become fuel for the common fire. We're not getting a cookie-cutter event, says George Everett, director of Main Street Uptown Butte, a festival partner. The NCTA really pays attention to local culture, local communities, and yet they have a great, well-honed program they're very experienced with. They do a great job of compensating where there's weaknesses, but always recognizing where our strengths are. NCTA director Julia Olin says, because we're bringing the music to where people live and work, it creates a very different sense of ownership. It's not, we own this, but you can come visit. It's, we're going to put this where you live, and it's going to be yours. The National Folk Festival was founded in 1934 by Sarah Gertrude Knott, a formidable, intelligent, passionate woman. And it starts with her, the idea that miracles are just part of the job. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow African-American contralto Marian Anderson to sing at their whites-only Constitution Hall. But from 1938 to 1942, the National was there, hosting blues legend W.C. Handy, black activist playwright Zora Neale Hurston, and a host of non-white performers. In the 1950s, rumors swirled that the National might be a communist front. Not burst unannounced into the office of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, something no mere president would dare to do, and upbraided him for allowing the Americanism of her or her festival to be challenged. He sheepishly told her he would stop the rumors, and he did. And yet throughout the McCarthy era, the National regularly hired blacklisted folk singer Pete Seeger. Miracles. But by the 1960s, the National seemed tired, out of step. In 1971, the National Park Service assigned its forward-thinking director of folk programming, Andy Wallace, to salvage the National's troubled residency at Wolf Trap. He brilliantly revitalized it, mixing purely traditional acts with professional folk stars and ensuring that the partnership with the National Park Service became ongoing. In 1976, the NCTA was formed as the National's umbrella organization and Joe Wilson became its director. 
He combined the folkloric savvy of a Ralph Rinsler with the showmanship of a P.T. Barnum. Under his watch, the festival was reverently traditional and more fun than a Bourbon Street Saturday night. Some of today's biggest folk stars thank the National for helping launch their careers, including Alison Krauss, Michael Flatley, Shamika Copeland, Steve Riley, Ricky Skaggs, and Sullis. The NCTA also produces scores of musical tours, both national and global, operates the Blue Ridge Music Center, helps with cultural programming for national parks, the Library of Congress, and the National Endowment for the Arts, produces TV programs, radio shows, films, and CDs, all in a day's work. And what's the payoff for them? Julia Olin remembered cowboy poet Paul Zarsky watching the National in Richmond a few years ago. This has been so good for me, he told her. I'm recovering my faith. Look at us all here, appreciating each other, getting along. This is who we are. This is who we really are as a people. Julia said, I know that sounds corny, sounds simple, but it's gratifying. Simple? (laughs) Only to the NCTA. To the rest of us, it sounds like a miracle. Shame.